Welcome to the premiere episode of Tesla Unwired, a new podcast series presented by the Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe, where we'll be exploring thought-provoking topics every month. All these thought-provoking topics are based on the great inventor Nikola Tesla. In this podcast, we're specifically going through why Nikola Tesla built tunnels beneath his laboratory in Shoreham. We have our host today, Mark Alessi, Executive Director of the Tesla Science Center in Wardenclyffe, who is also a serial entrepreneur. Mark. Thank you so much. So again, thank you for joining us. This is our inaugural show, so it's going to be somewhat organic, uh, but we moved up the, the schedule of launching this program, given the fact that many of us are staying at home and social distancing. So we thought that our, our new virtual programming would be a, a good benefit to our members and to Tesla enthusiasts. And as we were planning the first show, uh, one of the people that came to mind as the perfect guest to launch the show uh, is the famed and, and well-known Tesla biographer, Mark Seifer, who is joining us here today. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Um, having a lot of uh, time with my family. <laughs> Um, so Mark, I got involved with the Tesla Science Center, uh, before it was the Tesla Science Center. Uh, there was a group here on Long Island led by Jane Alcorn, our board president, um, who were trying to save Nikola Tesla's last lab, uh, for a number of years. And at the time I was an elected official in the community, and I did not, I had to be educated on, on Nikola Tesla. Um, once I realized how important he was, I got sucked up into the movement and never left. And I have to think that you might have a similar story. How did you get so involved in studying the life and times of Nikola Tesla? It really began when I was, uh, back in 1976, I was teaching courses in parapsychology and I had a good friend, Howard Smuckler. And he was teaching a course on UFOs. And I went down to write an article. He, he was an editor of a couple of magazines, ESP Magazine and Ancient Astronauts. So I went to New York City to do a, a report on one of, the, on one of my topics. And, and I came across a, uh, an article about this fellow who was born on the planet Venus, who landed on the Earth to give us all these inventions, fluorescent lights, uh, the induction motor, um, wireless communication, hydroelectric power system, remote control, robots. And his name was Tesla. And I thought it was kind of ridiculous. Um, so, but I was in the New York Public Library. So I looked up his name and I said, my gosh, he really lived. This is a real person. And, he, and he'd written an article on high frequency phenomena. So I went back to Rhode Island where I was teaching and living and I told Howard and he said, oh, Tesla here. So he gave me two books. He gave me O'Neill's, John O'Neill's biography called Prodigal Genius. And he gave me another book written by Arthur Matthews. And that, and that book was called, and that book was called um, uh, Tesla and the Venusian Spaceship. And it claimed that Tesla was still alive. This was 1976. And he was about 114 years old, living on a UFO, landing in this guy's backyard in Canada. So that's how I got um, introduced to Tesla. And I then was getting articles from and uh, newsletters from um, a UFO organization. And it was from there that I got a book of Tesla's patents. And it's this thick, it's, you know, it's a thousand pages long and it's got his patents, his lectures and his articles. And I looked at all those patents and I said, my gosh, this guy's the real deal. I have to find out if he really is the primary inventor of all these inventions. And once I found out that he was, I made him the subject of my doctoral dissertation. And that's really how I got into it. That's, uh, you know, so in reading the book, um, you, what, what was it like to research uh, that book? I mean, how long did it take you to write that first book? Well, I began in 1976 and the book was published in 1996, which is 20 years later. Um, my doctoral dissertation, which was a study of why his name disappeared from the history books, was 700 pages long. And, you know, I could have gotten a doctorate writing a 200 page article, but I, I felt once I was in there, I didn't want to go back and redo it. 
So I was down at Brown University and, and University of Rhode Island, and I was really, you know, in, in the uh, basement of these different archives going through all these ancient uh, uh, articles and magazines and journals from the 1890s, piecing together Tesla's life story. And Leland Anderson had a bibliography, which was kind of a roadmap of giving me another uh, way to get access to articles. I used the Freedom of Information Act. So my doctorate took, you know, five or six years to get. And then I put another 10 years or so into writing the book. I just never stopped. I just kept going on and on. And in the meantime, I was lecturing uh, from 1984 till the book got published in 1996. Every other year, I lectured at the International Tesla Society meetings in Colorado Springs. So that enabled me to meet the Corum brothers and Tom Bearden and uh, Dr. Marinchinch, who I'd already been to Yugoslavia in 1986. He was the head of the Tesla Museum. So I was gaining access to top secret information, information that only the, the experts, experts knew about Tesla. And that enabled me to put all this together. And what I wanted to also do was create a, a, a clear chronology. Uh, the O'Neill book is very good. The Cheney book's pretty good. Uh, but there are gaps and there are questions. And I wanted to fill in as many gaps as I possibly could. So I created a very clear chronology year by year. I was the first person to do this. And I also dealt with mysteries. The biggest mystery uh, was why uh, Wardenclyffe failed. And so I spent literally two years mapping out the letters between Tesla and JP Morgan. And all of that is in my book, Wizard, where I really explain precisely uh, what happened. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, he basically ran out of money. And the, the big issue, and Morgan you know, stopped funding him. The big issue though, which gets us to the story of the tunnels, is uh, whether or not Wardenclyffe was, was viable, whether or not it really made sense. So I've done a lot of research on that. So uh, following up on that, um, I've, I've heard two schools of thought that Morgan and Tesla remained friends, but that Morgan saw this as too risky of an investment and wouldn't continue to put more money in because of the increased ambition that Tesla uh, was, was, was putting into the project. And the other school of thought is that Morgan was very upset with Tesla uh, in expanding the scope from a single transmission to Europe to multiple bandwidth radio with multiple channels, two-way communication, and potentially wireless transmission of electricity and that not only did he not put money in, but he was chasing people off. So from your research, what have you found in that relationship? Well, I think you're right on both counts. Tesla needed to maintain a friendly relationship with Morgan, and they were both very secretive. But Morgan's children, J.P. Morgan Jr., for instance, didn't know the details. And, and when Morgan died in uh, uh, 1913, uh, all of his papers were, were supposedly burned. Uh, so the only records are Tesla's records. I think in essence, what happened was uh, Morgan began to fear that maybe Tesla would succeed in transmission of wireless power. And if he did, Morgan had copper mines, he had rubber plantations, um, he had lumber yards, he had lumber, he had uh, forests in, in, in Alaska. He wanted wires. And plus he didn't know how to, how do you build somebody uh, on a wireless system? So when Tesla was telling Morgan I could create an unlimited number of wireless channels, uh, Morgan, first of all, didn't necessarily believe him, but if he was telling the truth, how do you build them? We now have computers that can do that. And Tesla claimed he could do it. Uh, but th I think that his, one of Morgan's fear was, was that maybe Tesla would succeed. And if he did, he would really upset the prevailing apple cart. Yeah. Uh, but they did maintain uh, friendly relations uh, throughout that period. Uh, even though it was strained, Tesla was invited, I know it's ridiculous, but Tesla was invited to his uh, funeral. And he shortly thereafter was being funded by JP Morgan Jr. on turbines. So he, he always maintained a cordial relationship. Uh, and, uh, but the bottom line was that he was extremely angry at Morgan uh, because Morgan uh, ruined his great dream, which uh, you know, we will get into in a couple of seconds. So in, in, in getting to that, uh, and I appreciate that, Mark. Thank you. Um, so Wardenclyffe, uh, many people on the line, uh, is, is now named Shoreham, Shoreham, New York, and that's where the lab is located. Uh, but at the time, it was called Wardenclyffe, and Tesla named the lab Wardenclyffe. And for many people, um, 
it is a place of mystery and a place of inspiration in terms of it embodied Nikola Tesla and his ethos. And for those of you who are new, are new to the, the current project, that's our goal. And now that we've preserved his lab, we are in the process of uh, opening it to the public. We're just starting construction later this year. Um, and the goal is a museum dedicated to Tesla, uh, but also a more robust science center built around that on the other 16 acres. So a museum that tells his story as accurately as possible, a science center that inspires the Teslas of tomorrow and, and pushes Tesla's ethos of innovation for the improvement of humanity. And then finally, a way to help the Teslas of today, a business accelerator that pulls together the crowd that helped save this property to provide business mentorship uh, to inventors like Nikola Tesla. Uh, but if you take a look at Nikola Tesla, he is somebody that made some of the preeminent inventions at the end of the 19th century um, and or in going into the 20th century and they changed our lives. He, he's the, the, uh, the inventor of the 20th century. Um, in doing that, he sometimes self-sacrificed. He gave up royalties to uh, some of the patents that he uh, had in place that enabled the, the transmission of alternating current electricity. Um, and he did this because he wanted to move humanity forward. And Wardenclyffe, as uh, Mark had said, was, was going to be the crown jewel of a number of his inventions. Um, he was a celebrated inventor who came out to uh, Long Island with some funding from one of the preeminent financiers at, at first. Um, and then he built something that is still a mystery to many. Mark, you know the history of Nikola Tesla. You continue to study it. And I recently saw you on a TV show called The Tesla Files. Uh, where they were delving into some of his inventions, the tunnels. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Yes. If we go back to about 1986, 1985, I'm not exactly sure what year it was. It could have even been 1984. I went to the site of Wardenclyffe and I, I, went, I went onto the property. There wasn't no trespassing sign, but I went onto the property and I photographed the, uh, the foundation and I photographed uh, the building and uh, a guy came running out and said, get the heck off the land. And, he, and I said, but it's Tesla's place. I was so happy to be there. And he said, get off. So I was driven off the land. Uh, but on my way back to the car, I saw a little mound. It looked like an igloo to me or an outside oven, uh, about three feet tall. And I stupidly did not photograph it. I wished I had because it'd be the most valuable photograph on the planet right now. Uh, but that has everything to do with the tunnels. Um, I think what happened after 9-11, they created a memorial site uh, right by the fire station. And I think they destroyed that little mound that I had seen at that time. Uh, but uh, it, there must be a photograph. Somebody must have photographed these things. Um, You're giving but, me a new mission <laughs> to go yeah, and find a photograph. Right. So uh, one of the important things about this, though, is it, when I wrote my book in 1996, I mentioned that it was looked like an igloo. And that word has stuck, and uh, my name has been disattached from it, but I'm the guy who came up with it. Um, and uh, uh, so I think it's important to realize that it just, to me, it looked like an igloo. So that's how uh, the term came. But it was linked to, I think, a, an air shaft uh, that we'll get into. I have a bunch of slides, but I think it makes sense to, uh, to talk first, and then maybe it, we can run through the slides uh, at the end of the talk, and, and that will uh, be easier there. So uh, about uh, two or three years ago, I got called from Prometheus Films in Hollywood and uh, uh, Kevin Burns, who's the uh, producer of Ancient Aliens, said, uh, would you like to fly out to Hollywood and uh, start a, a show called The Tesla Files with me? And I said, sure. So I flew out. I met uh, Travis Taylor, who's got two PhDs in, in rocket science, and Jason Stapleton, who was uh, actually a uh, in, in the army uh, and was in Afghanistan, maybe in, also in Iraq. And he was a investigative journalist. And the three of us and also my writing partner, Tim Eaton, uh, from uh, worked for Industrial Light and Magic for many years, 
uh, we went out to Serbia, we went to the museum, and we started to look for files that were missing, and we tried to understand about the tunnels. Kevin Burns really wanted to find out if these tunnels really existed. I wrote about them extensively in Wizard, my Tesla biography, and he hired a, a ground penetrating radar group that went over the land right at Wardenclyffe, and uh, there was a great investment in time, energy, and in funds, I would say well in excess of $100,000 uh, to get these photographs that we'll see uh, a, a little bit later on. So I had read about the tunnels and the only way we knew about the tunnels was because in 1922, five years after the, uh, the Wardenclyffe was destroyed, Tesla was being sued by uh, Waldorf Astoria uh, and Tesla was saying, uh, you're suing me, but you destroyed a property worth, you know, t uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm going to explain why. It had all this equipment, had these generators, and it also had the, these, uh, a shaft going down 120 feet. It had four tunnels. I had testing equipment there. I was going to measure the size of the earth with this. I was going to transmit uh, uh, power around the earth. I created these earth grippers, which were... Um, uh, metal prongs which went into the earth 60 or 70 feet under the ground and he's explaining all that. When I wrote the book, the way he wrote it, uh, uh, Gary Peterson, another Tesla expert, thought that the prongs were gone, went one after the other. So when he said he put 300 feet worth of pi piping, he thought it went out in one direction 300 feet. And at the time, after he wrote that, I thought well, maybe he's right. But I said it looked like spokes on a wheel. Um, and uh, as it turns out, we got back the photos of the uh, ground penetrating radar and lo and behold, wow, there were the prongs going out like the spokes on a wheel that I said. And there were the actual four tunnels about 65, 70 feet under the ground. Um, so we could, uh, you know, go through some of the slides and get to that point. Maybe that might make sense. And then I could uh, point out, what, you know, what we've learned. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'll ask uh, Deb or Lisa if you could pull the slides up while we chat. Uh, I'd like to have Mark point out some of what he had learned. Um, while, while they're pulling that up, um, I've heard a number of different accounts of what those tunnels were for. I've heard everything from drainage, just to make sure that the tower base wasn't too moist. Uh, I guess he had the the rod that went down, uh, what, 200 feet into the ground and the tower itself went 187 feet in the air and that rod he didn't want to be wet. Or I've heard that uh, it was a way to grip the earth uh, and a way to potentially send radio or, or, or even electrical transmission through the earth. What's your understanding of what he was trying to do and what, what the purpose of the tunnels were? Yeah, the, the tower is 187 feet and you were close. It's 120 feet down to the bottom. And, uh, you know, you've got groundwater. Uh, fortunately, uh, they didn't hit uh, water, although otherwise this thing would have been flooded. Travis Taylor said there had to be pumps down there. But there are four tunnels that are 100 feet long and they're, you know, 10 feet high. Uh, th these are major constructions, 70 feet down, 65 feet down. And right above them are these prongs uh, going out like uh, like spokes on a wheel. And those are the, he called them earth grippers. So what we're dealing with is two different theories on how to transmit wireless uh, in information and wireless power. What Tesla was saying was very adamant about this, that Marconi was sending energy, was, was sending wireless messages through the air. The big difference also between Tesla and Marconi is that Marconi was using a Hertzian spark gap message with, uh, system, which meant that all he could do would be to translate, transmit Morse code. Uh, Tesla, on the other hand, invented continuous wave frequencies. Um, so he is really the inventor of the, of the wireless system that we use today. And Marconi eventually had to switch over to that. By the time he switched over, the, the patents were so mixed up, he bought other people's patents. So it was tough to prove that it was Tesla's unless you really got into the heart and soul of it. And there was a, a, a trial in 1915, which wasn't completely resolved, but all the top experts were there, including Zenek and Braun. Braun was, shared the Nobel Prize with, with uh, Marconi. 
um, and John Stone Stone, who was the head of the Electrical Society at the time. And they all said this was Tesla's system. Um, so we're looking at Tesla's system. And, uh, and so, um, uh, so that so that's you know uh, where we we're at, and uh, I lost my train of thought because I'm seeing different images uh, come <laughs> on here. Um, I'm blowing up the images that. Uh, oh yeah. So oh, hold it. Stop. Stop. Can we go back a minute? Yes. Uh, go back one more. It's him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is the cover of my book. There there were two covers. Uh, Mark has the older book. I like the older book, but this one really zaps and, and shines. And it's certainly one of my all-time favorite photographs of Tesla. Tesla believed in studying. He, he studied the work of nature. He, he studied Goethe, who said all of the secrets are in nature. Right now, we're dealing with the coronavirus. The solution to, to solving the coronavirus, obviously, is to clone the antibodies. Because we, the only way you can beat a virus today is to, is to produce your own antibodies to fight it off. So if we clone the antibodies, or if we create a, a virus that looks just like the coronavirus, uh, but is missing a, an important function that attaches to the lungs. Um, that's how you do it. Um, so Tesla is studying here because he's trying to show you that, that he learned from other people. Okay, the next slide. Sure. Yeah, this is inside Tesla's laboratory. So this is in Wardenclyffe. Now, what's very interesting about the Wardenclyffe laboratory and what Mark was talking about I think one of the ways we can raise additional money is this is a Stanford White building. Uh, this is McKim, Mead, and White. Uh, and Stanford White is the premier architect of the day. So you have the greatest scientist of the day, the greatest inventor of the day, uh, working with the greatest uh, 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 laboratory. Uh, uh, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, the greatest scientist of the day working with the greatest architect of the day, funded by the greatest financier of the day. That's what this project was all about. And here you can see a bunch of his testing equipment. In the far background uh, on the left is his remote control boat. It's hard to see. And you, you see that circular uh, coil, which is in that photograph. Okay, the next slide. So this is me uh, in the 1980s. And you can see uh, the uh, Wardenclyffe there. And that's, this is the day that I photographed this, uh, the, the, uh, the lab from the going on? foundation. <laughs> uh, but I was not able to, uh, I just didn't think to photograph this other little building. And I'm really sorry I didn't. OK, the next one. Sure. This is the same image that, that Mark has behind him. It's a beautiful image, and of course, the Tesla Museum has all of these fantastic images, but you can see the beauty of the building. Uh, again, it's a Stanford White building, so I think we should, you know, get in league with, with the architects who, uh, just to preserve this building alone, even if it had nothing to do with Tesla, would be very valuable simply because it's a Stanford White building. And you see that he, he needed to raise an additional $50,000 to put the cupola on, to, on top. He raised that on his own. He didn't get any money, additional money from Morgan. He puts the cupola on top. And he says, I've, I've done all of this, JP. You know, how about helping me finish this thing? And, and Morgan blocks him. And I explain that in detail, how he blocks him in, in my book. OK, next slide. Well, Mark, I just want to comment on that. So we talk about how the Tesla Science Center will be a place that helps convene innovators. And uh, myself, I'm a serial entrepreneur, and I work with startups across New York State and now nationally and internationally. So raising capital is always a pain point. And many of us listen to the Tesla story of how close he was to, uh, to his dream and how he incrementally was raising capital. We feel his pain with that. So we, we follow your story there very closely. Yeah, and, and I mean, what's $50,000 today, you know? I mean, he, he raised an additional 50,000 on his own. That's a lot of money today that's equivalent to probably 20 or 30 million in, in those days. I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of money. And there's always the story, uh, whether you could, you, you can validate or debunk that when he came to work, you know, a lot of people don't realize he came to work directly under Edison at first when he came to the United States. That's why he originally came to the United States. And uh, he was to unlock the issues that Edison was having with direct current electricity. And Tesla agreed, although he was trying to convince Edison 
to move towards alter, alternating current that he told Edison, I know how to pull this off and it'll be a whole lot better uh, and more efficient. Edison didn't want to switch gears, but supposedly he promised Tesla $50,000 if he unlocked those issues with direct current. Tesla does his job and Edison says, you don't understand, that wasn't a real offer. That was like an off the cuff joke remark. Um, I guess that $50,000 would have helped Tesla a whole lot uh, as he was at Wardenclyffe. But what's the real nature of that story? I think it's a nail on the head. I think that, that uh, Edison said, gosh, if you could do that, there's $50,000 in it for you. And Tesla took him at his word and assumed that he was actually gonna get $50,000. But the problem with Edison was, Edison was fighting against uh, uh, Elihu Thompson of Thompson Houston and also uh, the Westinghouse company, George Westinghouse. Both of those people were dabbling in, in alternating current and, and Edison was using direct current. He'd used direct current for 20 years and direct current makes a lot of sense. It goes in one direction and, and it works. Alternating current changes its direction of flow at thousands of times a second. Edison understood that. So we thought Tesla was nuts because how could you possibly harness a current that's going in opposite directions at thousands of times a second and make it go in one direction? That's the genius of Tesla. Again, I explained very clearly in Wizard uh, how he did this, but basically he came up with two uh, uh, circuits out of phase with each other, which created a ro rotating effect. And this is the, you know, ro the rotating magnetic field. Once you understand it, and if you, if you spend maybe seven or eight minutes studying uh, page 17 or whatever it is in my book, you will understand something that no one understood. Right now, we're right at the very same moment, right this moment, the person who comes up with the, with the vaccine for, for, uh, you know, for the coronavirus will, will be, you know, will deserve all the accolades. And then everyone else will say, oh, geez, I could have done that. And that's what happened with regards to AC. Everyone said, oh, I, you know, that's, you know, I could have come up with that. So we had to fight William Stanley and, and many other people Charles Steinmetz, who claimed that they, that was their invention, um, and and that's why uh, his uh, uh, alignment with um, George Westinghouse was so important. Westinghouse fought all of them, and Tesla did rip up a royalty clause worth millions and millions of dollars uh, because uh, there was a because they were in a huge fight, the fight of their life, and and Tesla was very afraid that he would scrap uh, the AC uh, device. And just go back to the Westinghouse had a thousand power plants that were all making money all over the country. Why should he scrap a thousand power plants to switch over to this one? And then once it, it happened at Niagara Falls, from one spot in Niagara Falls, not only could you light homes all over the, the Northeast, but you could also run factories. And Tesla was then, even at, when he spoke in 1897, at the inauguration as the inventor of the hydroelectric power system, he said, I got something even better than this. We don't even need wires. I'm gonna be able to jump continents. And they thought he was nuts. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. This particular yep. slide right here, um, Robert Golka gave me this slide and he was you know, a very important Tesla expert who built huge, uh, 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 two huge towers. What he pointed out to me is the lead uh, that, that shows in here. If you look at the ladder on the, on the right side, to the left of the ladder, you'll see a, a, a black a bar going up with little tiny steps all along the way. And that's a lead. That is, a, a, that, yes, that's exactly it. That is the uh, connection to the ground uh, uh, earth grippers down under the ground. Where, where it should have been was a central pole down the center of uh, the Wardenclyffe Tower. There is no central pole. He never was able to put this central shaft in. But what Gulk was able to show me is that he did indeed harness uh, Wardenclyffe once. It was in 1903. And there's the proof, that, that, that little lead. Okay, uh, next slide. So this is an aerial view. And you can see the circle on, on the left. That's the site of Wardenclyffe. And uh, in the center of the slide is, is the actual laboratory. Um, so the fire station is, is, at, is at the bottom uh, left. And um, it's like, it looks like a house on the bottom left. Yes. Over right. here? Yeah. Okay. 
and go right to the corner, right there, a little bit across, the, right there, a little closer to me, a little closer to me, a little across the street, a little closer to me. No, closer to, uh, to, the, to the bottom. To the bottom. Right there, yeah. Okay. Right where they put the... Uh, this is where the memorial right. is, yes. Yeah. Right in that area uh, is where I saw this um, uh, little uh, igloo-shaped device. It was about three feet tall. It looked like a brick, little brick building, little outside oven. And I knew it was attached to Wardenclyffe. And it, it was a forest. There was a little bit of a forest there. And you know, I was walking back to the car and I noticed it. And I thought, well, oh, I'll come back someday. Maybe I'll photograph it. I mean, I didn't put much, you know, I was just, I was walking by it. And I've never seen any other direct reference to it. And it, it, it really, it really bugs me. But anyhow. Well, uh, so that before was, we move on, Mark, I, I've yeah. seen some of the participants of today's web call, which, by the way, I know we're going over. I hope you guys don't mind. If you do, send us some messages. Uh, but uh, we're just, we're just going to make sure that we get the full story here and we're not cutting this short. Uh, so that being said, I've seen some folks and names that I recognize from the Long Island community and the local community around the lab. So I'm throwing a challenge out. Find Mark that igloo. Find, go to your neighbors who has pictures of it. Go to the Rocky Point Fire Department. Let's get that picture. Let's get it for, to Mark for his research and let's share it with our members. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Sorry. Great. Next slide. Yeah, this is the photograph I took in about 1984 of the uh, foundation. My heart was beating. And they were, I, could, I didn't know there was a foundation there. I mean, I walked onto the property and there's my, the foundation of my hero. I mean, it was just, it, I, my mind was blown and this guy comes running out, get off the property. And you see that bolt uh, uh, on the left there that I think is still now in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the research center at, at the Tesla lab. Okay, the next slide. Before you move on, <laughs> yes. I'm gonna interject. First of all, you're always welcome. You know that. And if you ever wanna, and you know that. Uh, to come see the uh, the tower base, but we also uh, a lot of the folks on the line. You know, we have members and, and and folks that aren't members. All of our members are allowed to set appointments to come and and tour the property. Uh, you know, on an appointment basis. But uh, this property is 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 everyone's. Um, this is a, a global resource, and we're just trying to be uh, responsible stewards. So. Uh, if anybody is uh, traveling to New York and uh, looking to see the property and you're a member, um, and if you're not a member, you know, go to our website. Um, we'd love to uh, welcome you on site. We have a number of events throughout the year. So going to the next slide. You know, when we were uh, trying to raise the money, I met with uh, diplomats. I met with a diplomat from Croatia. I was so afraid that either the Serbs or the Croats would come up with the million dollars, which wasn't very much money. And I sent my Tesla biography to Andrew Cuomo. And he mailed the book back to me with a very nice letter saying, unfortunately, I can't accept this. And, and my plea was, you know, this is the richest state in the, in the country, if not the world. You can't come up with a million dollars to save the property. And of course, Matt Inman and, and Jane Alcorn, you know, got together. And well, so great. on that history, you, you know, I was in the state legislature at the time and uh, I was able to get uh, 850,000 set aside in the state budget, which when Jane and Matt went into the crowd fund, they were raising money to match that original 850,000, which was the sales pr sale price of the property. And that's the way, you know, the state funding works. You have to spend it and then you get the reimbursement. So once you have it, sometimes you, out, you go out and you get a loan and, and such. But uh, since then, uh, the board had applied for a grant of 500,000, which will help open the visitor center later this year. And just this year, we applied through what is called a regional economic development council in New York state. And we were able to get another 750,000 directly for the lab building. Um, in that process, we worked with our local state Senator, uh, Ken Laval, who is now retiring. And we set up appointments with the governor's office and we asked the state for an additional capital grant and prior to the entire world shutting down um, they had indicated that they were going to try to get additional funding for the tesla lab in the state budget uh, obviously no promises were made and the state budget is a volatile process 
And now with the introduction of, you know, some economic issues worldwide, don't know if we'll get it this year, but I, I can say this, that the governor and his staff, probably starting from you reaching out back then and, and from all the work that's happened since then, uh, they're definitely watching the site closely and do want to help. It's great news. Excellent news. I mean, I, I think we should have a bond uh, for, say, 20 million or something and really do it right. Okay, so this is a, one of my favorite photos of, of the tower and the laboratory. Uh, it's just aesthetically, it just, you know, just, it's, so, it's such a mind blowing story. Okay, the next slide. It, it, Mark, if, if, if you don't mind, uh, I know I saw Dave Madigan uh, as one of our participants, and maybe he'll speak later on when we open up the uh, phone lines. But uh, at the top of that tower, which is, you know, close to 187 feet in the air, uh, Dave told me stories. Dave's family goes back a few generations here in this local community. So back to just around Tesla's time. In fact, his grandfather painted for um, Jacob Astor and for Stanford White uh, murals for those hotels. Um, and Tesla lived basically down the block from, from Madigan's family. But the stories are uh, that local children who are now the great grandfather and grand great grandmothers of some of the folks that live in this community, they would climb that tower after Tesla left, obviously, and ice skate on top, you know, in, in that ring that is up here. And uh, so when you're saying, you know, take a look at this photo, that's the first thing that pops in my mind that young children were climbing to the top of this tower and ice skating up there in the winter. You know, I, I, Jane Alcorn told me that story and I made up the names of the people. So if you could email me the actual names of the people, I wouldn't have to use the made up names that I did. So it, what one of them that I know is definite is a, a gentleman named uh, Marvin Pallister. Um, and his grandson um, is one of our advisors. Uh, his name is Tom Spear. Uh, and, and his family helped start the uh, local village, the village of Shoreham. Uh, but I will get you more names from Tom. That would be great. Now here uh, it was, uh, I think 2013, when uh, the Tesla statue uh, was inaugurated and given by the, the Serbian people. And you can see uh, Jane in the blue dress. She's standing next to the president of Serbia and down uh, with, the, with the red tie, I think, is uh, Bill Turbo. Yeah, Bill Turbo with the red tie. Um, and it was just an incredible event and they're all standing inside uh, the foundation where I had been you know, kicked off the property, you know, 15, 20 years earlier. Okay, uh, this was the, amazing event. You know, I, 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 for the folks that are watching, uh, uh, Mark pointed out Jane, Jane Alcorn, she's in the blue dress in this photo over here. Uh, some of you already know this, some of you that might be, you know, new to the, the local story of how Tesla's lab was saved. If it wasn't for that woman, uh, I don't think that this, worldwide historic treasure would have been saved. She was a driving force for at least two decades. Um, she corralled science teachers in the area, tried to educate people on the history of the property. And again, had to educate people on the history of Tesla because here in the United States, uh, a lot of folks were ignorant to how important he was and that's changing now. But uh, take note of the woman in the blue dress. Uh, she is the, the godmother of this project. Okay, so here, uh, this was taken at the top of uh, the Hotel New Yorker. We did a couple of uh, uh, shows at the Hotel New Yorker in, in the show, The Tesla Files, which played on the History Channel. And um, it's now available on Hulu. So in the center, I'm on the right there, in the center is Travis Taylor. He has two PhDs, can you imagine that? And he's a rocket scientist, he has top secret clearance. He works with NASA. And on the left is Jason Stapleton, who has been in the military. And he's a, we were three buddies who were exploring, getting new information, information we've never been found before about Tesla. I'll tell you one story about Travis. We were at the Wardenclyffe site and he's watching a rocket ship take off on his little iPhone. And I said, you know, we're getting ready to shoot. And he said, I said, I said Travis, what, why are you spending time on this? He says, because I have a satellite on that on that rocket ship. I mean, that's how amazing right. uh, that was. 
they were, they were definitely impressive, you know. So, Mark, I binge watched that show uh, once I started with one. Uh, I knew that you had done a show. There, there were two or three shows that were coming out around the same time. Uh, this one really stood out, and obviously, one because of your involvement, but two, uh, you know, having uh, your your two compatriots on the show. There, it was it was a very entertaining show, but the way it ended on each episode, I just had to go on to the next episode. So. My wife lost me for about two days while I uh, binge watched that show. And I, I'll leave I, it on for one more second. Yeah, sure. Oh, you can go to the next one. Actually, you can go to the next one. So just b before I do, uh, this reminds me of a scene on the show where you released pigeons and the, the whole concept that, you know, Tesla towards the end of his life got more eccentric. And, um, you know, I, I look at some of the reputational damage that Tesla uh, had to endure, whether it was, you know, some of those potential or, or rumored idiosyncrasies as he got older, or I think, you know, you mentioned some of his contemporaries who were jealous of his invention of, uh, you know, around alternating current um, technologies. Uh, you know, in reading your book, I saw some of that history where they were casting aspersions early on uh, that were unfair and untrue. Um, so when you get to the pigeons, that he was very close to the pigeons, or there was a theory on the show that he was actually using carrier pigeons to send messages. What what was behind that, and you know, is there any validity to that? Or well, this was this is the Hotel New Yorker. The Hotel New Yorker had its has its own had its own generator in the Great Blackout, nineteen sixty six or sixty seven, whenever it was. Uh, the whole Northeast went out, but not the Hotel New Yorker. It kept going. So we realized that during World War II, uh, the Hotel New York would be very important because if it was hit by a bomb or, or a, a sabotage, uh, that hotel could still have electricity. So military people would be there, not just because Tesla was there and they were following him, but also because the hotel itself was, was a very important uh, uh, area. And they were working with uh, passing the pigeons. And uh, Van Eva Bush, uh, who was the head of top secret weapons development uh, for the United States, and including uh, George United. Bush's relative, George Bush, George W. Bush's relative, or no? He's not related to George Bush. Okay. He was the uh, head of uh, the electrical department at uh, MIT. He started Raytheon Corporation. Okay. And uh, and I get all in, into all this in my new book. It's called Tesla Wizard at War, which will be out probably at the end of the year. Um, and he assigns uh, one of his faculty, John G. Trump, to look at Tesla's papers after he died. Uh, and, he, and Tesla died in the Hotel New Yorker. Now, so Bush, was, Bush, was Bush, wasn't, Bush wasn't related to Bush, but was Trump related to Trump? He's his uncle. That's what I thought. Uh, so he's his father's brother. He was born in 1907 and uh, died in the 1980s, I think. Um, so Van Eva Bush was actually working with pigeons, putting them inside. The idea would be to put them inside uh, bombs, and they would recorrect. So if you if you had a target in sight, the pigeon would get it to correct because the pigeon would die in the process. So they eventually abandoned the project. But we now know that Van Eva Bush was working with pigeons, and Tesla was working with pigeons. And a, and, a, and a passenger pigeon flew into the 40th uh, uh, window and Tesla took care of it. They gave it to Tesla to take care of it. So we drew a parallel that maybe Tesla was working with the military. It was, a, you know, it was a far out theory, but it had some basis in reality. So I thought it was worth exploring and, and we had fun with it. And I released the pigeon right where I'm standing. And uh, Travis and Jason were in Brooklyn where, where the pigeon lived and it flew back there in three, four, five minutes because there's a, so crow flies, it's only eight or nine miles. Hmm. Okay, next slide. So this is us in front of the FBI building, the J. Edgar Hoover building. And I include this slide because you can really see the, how complex it is to tell uh, this show. There were three cameras, you can see two of them on, on each of us, uh, the director and the producer and the writer uh, Rob O'Brien is a writer. He's, he's got a, a little pad, pencil pad on the left there. And both directors were named Scott and producer. Um, and so I had obtained um, uh, papers from the FBI through the 
Freedom of Information Act. And by this time, they, they unredacted other papers. And I'm showing uh, Jason and Travis here the uh, uh, John G. Trump papers. Now, you talked about the backlash against Tesla. In my new book, Wizard at War, I really get into how, how important Tesla's work was for World War II, but there was a split uh, among two different groups. One group, uh, particularly backed by John G. Trump and probably Van Eva Bush, said that Tesla's particle beam weapon was, was not, never going to work and it wasn't worth uh, getting into. And another group headed by Blois Fitzgerald uh, and also uh, General uh, L.C. Craig E. from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base thought there really was something to it. So we were working, to, we had gotten um, uh, documents, uh, this uh, fellow, Leonard, I can't think of his last name right now, but he got a document from the OSS, which showed that the OSS was also interested in Tesla's papers. So that's what this was all about here. Okay, the, the next picture. Oh, give me one second. Okay, the other way. Yeah. Oh, we went back a little bit. Sorry about that. There we go. Yeah, so here we are in the basement of the Hotel New Yorker. And you can see this beautiful tunnel. These are Art Deco tiles. Uh, I wish I had taken photos of them. But it's, it's a big tunnel which leads to its own, um, its own subway station. It's closed now, but that leads right out to the subway. And Tesla in the 1930s, when he was living at the hotel, could have easily gone down in there and accessed the other hotels that he had uh, documents and, and trunks in. He had uh, documents and trunks in uh, Hotel Governor Clinton, where he probably had what he claimed was a part of the beam weapon. Uh, also the Hotel St. Regis and Hotel Pennsylvania. All that could be accessed there. And Travis got this wild idea that, that Tesla was uh, using Hotel New Yorker itself as a warden cliff. It's 600 feet tall. Um, it's got these tunnels, uh, which we're going to get into in a, a minute. Uh, and then we found a testing room at the top, which he could have used. And I thought it was a great idea. I didn't, I thought Tesla was actually physically too old to actually do what, what Travis came up with. But, te but Tesla did want to use these uh, high rise buildings. I found a letter to Woolworth where, when Tesla was working in the Woolworth building, which was the tallest building in the world at the time, was 800 feet tall, that he was going to set up his own wireless system at the top of the Woolworth building. So it wasn't that crazy an idea. But here we see a real tunnel. Uh, that Tesla lived at in the in Hotel New Yorker. Okay, next one. So we're now in Washington D.C., and Jason comes back with the uh, with the chip, you know, the flash drive, which we're going to look at. And this is from the ground penetrating radar. No one has ever seen this before, and my jaw drops because this is all done live. We don't practice stuff and then shoot it. We, we, he, they just give us the information and boom, it's shot for the Tesla files. So here you can see in yellow, those are the earth grippers. The brown shaft is going down about 50 feet and the white, uh, the white circular area, we're gonna get a better shot of it too, but, uh, but while we're looking at it, the white circular area is cement that they poured down about 15 or 20 years ago to block because unfortunately the shaft became a dump site but the timbers are still there for the uh, for the central shaft and what's in red are the tunnels uh, there are four of them and we'll see another shot of it it's, it's a much better shot and what's in blue is where the tunnels have collapsed okay next slide By the way, these uh, photos are supplied by Prometheus Films um, and Prometheus has allowed me to use uh, these slides, but I'm hoping that you guys will not reproduce them uh, because you need uh, permission from Prometheus. We won't. <laughs> I don't mean you, but I mean the, the other viewers. Um, but if you, if you look carefully here, you, you again see the earth grippers. There are about a dozen of them. So, and that, that shaft going down is about 50 feet down. Now, why did he have the tunnels? I think he had the tunnels because 
I don't know if you know about you, but going down five flights or seven flights of stairs every day uh, could be very tiring. So I think his plan was to bring equipment uh, down there and to, to keep a base actually down there. These tunnels are 100 feet long each. They're actually still there. Um, and I think that we could probably maybe get a probe uh, to go down there and look in there. There may or may not be any equipment in there, um, but that's what I think it was. I think he was gonna do testing there. And the idea was that this is the earth grippers. His plan was to map out the entire earth. He, he knew the, the size of the earth, the speed of light, um, and the length of the electrical waves that he was gonna send. Since he was sending it through the ground, if you extend the wave, for instance, if it's 60 miles from Wardenclyffe to New York City, if you have an electrical wave that lands in New York City, then you can transmit power from, from Wardenclyffe to New York City. If, if you want to send it to San Francisco, you need an electrical wave that's 3,500 miles long. And he could create electrical waves 3,500 miles long and pinpoint it to San Francisco. But he wanted to set up additional towers where he was going to send these these uh, various electrical power waves, and they'd be picked up by a central tower uh, in Europe or, or wherever he placed them and have a wireless uh, uh, network of, uh, of uh, mostly telephone, but he also was going to transmit power if he succeeded. Okay, the next slide. But before we move on, yes. if, if, if we end up doing an event where we want to explore the technology that Tesla was planning on um, implementing at Wardenclyffe, what kind of experts should we convene? Uh, you know, so you're talking about radio waves, is it RF experts or who should we pull together for that conversation? Obviously, I'm already inviting you to be the moderator, but who should we pull together to try to explain to the public and to even researchers what Tesla was trying to do? Well, one of the things that happened in the, in the Tesla files was what Travis Taylor did. Travis transmitted electrical energy uh, through the ground from one wireless tower to another, one Tesla coil to another Tesla coil. It was done on a very small scale, just 20 or 30 feet or whatever it was, but he proved that you could send electricity through the ground. Uh, so I would say Travis for sure. But uh, the people that would be on the top of my list would be uh, Ken and, and uh, Jim Corum, who have spoken uh, at um, uh, Wardenclyffe, and I've known them for, since 1984. Um, and they have set up a wireless tower in, in Texas, and they know exactly how to do this. Uh, but that would be my, uh, I would start with those people, and I would start with other, other Tesla experts. I can, can get you a list. There are certain uh, people from Serbia. Um, but the American community um, needs to get on board. We need to get physicists to have open minds uh, to look at this. Right. So here we are. This is a live shot. Uh, as it's happening, we are looking at, for the first time, uh, this incredible uh, achievement from the, the ground pen penetrating radar that Prometheus Films provided. Uh, and I added uh, the brown shaft underneath uh, the red at the very, very bottom of this image. And that, that is um, uh, yeah, right there, because it goes down another 30 or 50 feet. Okay, we've looked at that, so let's go to the next slide. Now, this is a drawing that I put together. This is a, a, a rough drawing of it. There'll be a little bit more polished in my new book. Uh, but here uh, you see uh, the four tunnels. The, the last tunnel on the, on the far right, it's a little tiny one. Three of them are 100 feet long. The fourth one is only about 40 feet long in the back. And I'm guessing here, where these uh, igloo-shaped uh, air shafts would be. That's what I think they are. They would be air shafts. Um, this was drawn by Lynn Savigny. Uh, she's a, a superb illustrator. And I added these actual pictures from a subway, an old postcard uh, to show, you know, uh, that my guess is that it'll be testing equipment. And again, what Tesla was doing uh, was transmitting energy through the earth. He said the whole entire development of radio was uh, wrong-headed because we send it mostly through the air when in fact it's the earth connection that makes the most sense. 
You know, this brings to mind the one story which I open up with in Wizard with. When I was a kid, I built a, a crystal radio set. And, and if anybody listening has you know, a 12 year old kid, build a crystal radio set with them. It's amazing. But my dad was an electrical engineer and he, he fixed televisions for a living. He built televisions for a living. And he helped set it up with me. And we had a wire which went around uh, throughout, we were on the second floor, went out through the window. And it was just a jar with wire wrapped around it uh, and a condenser and, and earphones. That was about it. And it didn't work. And I used a beer can as a dial. And I said, Dad, it's not working. He goes, I don't understand it. He goes, oh, yeah, I got it. And he attaches another wire to the radiator, which was the ground connection. And all of a sudden, I had uh, um, the ability to listen. I listened to the Muhammad Ali fight when he knocked out Sonny, Sonny Liston uh, on my uh, crystal radio set. So as a 12-year-old kid, I knew that the ground was very important. And Tesla was saying it's essential for sending electrical power by means of wireless. So for those listening, we're home with our kids. Not a bad project. Maybe we can get a lesson kit out on the Tesla Science Center website on uh, building a crystal uh, radio set. Yeah, it would be great. Okay, next one. So now we're up to about, uh, Tesla builds a tower in 1901. He runs out of money in 1906. I think he has a, a nervous breakdown. In my new book, I show his handwriting falling apart in 1906. Um, I haven't seen the final galley, so I hope they keep that picture of his handwriting falling apart. Um, but he's now back on track. He's working for Telefunken, and they had two wireless stations, one at Sayville and one in Tuckerton, uh, New Jersey. The one in Tuckerton was uh, 850 feet high, and Sayville was about, I think, 500 feet high. And this is around 1913, 1914, and World War I is beginning. So Tesla, they hired Tesla. They're paying him 1,500 bucks a month, and uh, he, and uh, uh, Jonathan Zenick and uh, Ferdinand Braun, the Nobel Prize winner with Marconi, take the boat to New York in 1915 because of the trial. Marconi has sued Telefunken and, and the US Navy, and they need Tesla to testify on their behalf. And Tesla goes out to Sayville and meets with, uh, with Zenick, and he said, you're sending too much energy through the air. You've got to send it through the earth. You've got to increase your ground connections. And Zenek is very famous now for, for ground waves. Well, that's where he got all the information from. So the Zenek wave, that seed was planted by Nikola Tesla in Zenek's head? Yeah. Tesla met with him and told him exactly, uh, and I have the details of all that in the new book, uh, of you know how to increase the ground connection. OK, the next slide. I'll tell you, Mark, the thing that's popping in my head is as wireless communications move towards the you know the next generation 5g um and it has to be closer to the consumer i the first question i'm going to have for some of the engineers today is can some of that be done by the ground uh so you might be hearing from me <laughs> okay one of the things i realized in in 1915 tesla uh if you look at the far left it says tesla's new device like bolts of thor this is 1915 the, the tower is still up it is world war one the great war and they're getting ready to knock down his tower because he owes rolled up a story of twenty thousand dollars in back rent and they're going to scrap the thing for fifteen hundred or two thousand they're just going to retrieve what little money they can uh because of the money that, that tesla owes them and so he reveals a great secret here he says that uh that he is going to use the tower to protect protect uh the United States from incoming invasions. So we can see that his invention of the particle beam weapon began at least in 1915. I think it will actually goes all the way back to the 1890s when he was doing x-ray experiments. You can see they list him as the winner of the Nobel Prize. They, the New York Times made a huge error. Tesla was never given the Nobel Prize, nor was Tom Edison. Uh, they were supposed to share it. It said uh, Edison was nominated at that time. <clears throat> but the uh, Tesla doesn't get nominated until about 1935. And the guy who nominates him, Aaron uh, was the fellow who also nominated Albert Einstein. So this is a very important um, New York Times article because it told me that the Wardenclyffe uh, Tower 
uh, was also had another function and that it could be uh, jury rigged uh, to uh, shoot down incoming planes or, uh, or uh, prevent you know, ships from, from coming in. Okay. I, I've heard this, this concept before. I don't know if you saw this past summer, every, every summer around Tesla's birthday, we throw a birthday party on site. And this past year, it grows every year. This year we had 1400 people on site. And uh, a gentleman named Greg Lay that I met out on the West Coast when we had a Tesla Science Center exhibit in Silicon Valley, Greg, I uh, was put in touch with him by the Exploratorium, you know, one of the best science centers in the world. Uh, they were advisors to us. Uh, some of the staff people advised us on the uh, exhibit and how to pull it together. And Greg Lay, um, he, he works at Google X, but his, his personal project is lightning on demand and he studies lightning. And I, I think he might be one of our next guests because now that you touched upon this, he was talking about how Tesla was using X-ray tubes, like you mentioned, to direct that, that, that transmission of electricity through the air. Um, and he said that everything culminates into it, it, all of his inventions were tied to each other for, you know, for larger purposes. So they were, they were one-off inventions, but they're all part of a larger platform technology that he was developing. Exactly. I mean, what Tesla was trying to do, he was trying to transmit voice, pictures, and power uh, by means of wireless communication. And he was envisioning, there's a quote from 1904, where he says, I'm going to change the, uh, the world into a brain, as it were, which will feel in all its parts. Now, he didn't invent the internet. No one, I don't think anybody really envisioned the internet, but he comes really close in 1904 when he sees the earth as a brain, as it were, which will feel in all its parts. And he's telling Morgan, uh, I can speak to somebody in Australia as if he's sitting across from me. Right now, you and I are separated by 150 miles or thereabouts. And we're, you know, it's like we're sitting in the room together, literally. And Tesla's envisioning that, that all at that moment right now. This is a mock-up of my book, uh, Tesla Wizard at War. It will not have this cover, um, but I, I like to, uh, uh, to use it because it shows the particle beam weapon. Uh, and that's in the center there is a new Tesla tower. Tesla worked with Titus de Babula to design a different Wardenclyffe tower. And that's what it looked like. It resembled the Van de Graaff generators. And embedded in that tower would have been the particle beam weapon uh, which would somehow have to be uh, aimed, uh, you know, in various ways. That's probably the hardest thing to do in this thing. And uh, he was negotiating, you know, with the Soviets, with the British Empire, and with uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the U.S. government uh, as World War II was proceeding uh, to sell his part of the beam weapon. <clears throat> and that's what this new book is all about. I really get into all the top people, including Joseph Stalin and in particular generals, uh, in, in uh, Great Britain. And uh, Roosevelt himself, we've got a letter signed by Roosevelt interested in, in meeting with Tesla and also Vannevar Bush, another letter from Vannevar Bush wishing Tesla a happy birthday uh, when he's uh, 75 years old. Um, so all of that is uh, embedded in this, in this new book. And a lot of it happened because of the Tesla files. I was already working on the sequel, but I got a lot of new information because of that. People from all over the world contacted me uh, and gave me uh, t top secret stuff, secret stuff from the Soviet Union, Union that had never been seen before, uh, photographs that had never been seen before. All of that is, is coming up. Okay, next slide. You know, I, I just got to say that this is fascinating. Um, you know, as we go down the path at the Tesla Science Center, this kind of subject is where we would want to convene folks like you and just we're really curious if some of this stuff could have worked. Um, uh, that, that Tesla was envisioning towards the end of his career, like that particle, particle beam. Is it a particle beam accelerator that you, you, you just said that similar to like that medical technology that is used today or? Well, what Tesla realized was that if you um, have a ray, a death ray, it spreads out. If you take a flashlight and aim it at, at, you know, far away from you, it spreads out, loses all its power. A laser beam keeps that same, you know, uh, tiny, narrow focus. So Tesla realized, and I think his genius was to realize, if I send out a tiny little bullet, bullet microscopic sight size, 
it, it can't spread out because it's one tiny bullet. It's a particle beam. I'm setting out little particles uh, uh, in, uh, to shoot down enemy planes. And he was negotiating with the British, in, for instance. He said, I want to protect you from, from Germany. If Germany attacks you, you build a few of these towers, you'll be able to protect you, uh, th this country from uh, an invasion. <clears throat> and one of the points, I don't know how much I get into exactly in the book, but one of the points I, I want to make is that when they built the nuclear bomb, they spent in today's money, trillions of dollars. They spent in those days, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, at Los Alamos to build the bomb. It wasn't like a hundred million or, you know, uh, or 200 million, it was in the billions. I mean, they spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to do that. And I think had you put that kind of uh, uh, energy and expertise uh, behind the particle beam weapon, I think uh, it would have succeeded because I, I think Tesla knew what he was talking about, but no one has been able to do that. What we've come close to it was with, with uh, um, you know, uh, we have laser guns right now um, and we have a rail gun, which does shoot out a particle, uh, which I think is based basically on Tesla's uh, idea. This is kind of, you know, stylized, but this is what the tower would have looked like had it been completed. It's, un it's unfortunate that there's no uh, drawing in the Stanford white papers because he's the architect, but there should have been. And there's no blueprints. We spent a, a lot of energy, Prometheus Films sent people literally all over the world looking for the blueprints uh, to see if the, where the tunnels would be and all of that, and even the design of the building. And there are no blueprints. No one's been able to locate any. That's another one, uh, Mark, where you could ask if anybody in Long Island has the blueprints for Wardenclyffe, that would be great. But well, he wants to send electrical- Where my head goes to, Mark, is, you know, in the Tesla files and even in the movie Tower to the People that was done by Joe Sikorsky, um, the, the, the story of how the FBI raided Tesla's hotel room uh, hours after his death and that there were a certain number of trunks in his hotel room and not all those trunks made it to the inventory uh, that was handed over to the Republic of Serbia and is now at the Belgard Museum. The question is, uh, with this technology, if he was trying to do uh, a military type of weapon, uh, maybe those blueprints isn't something that uh, has been released yet? Or do you think, do you, do you think it's more likely that uh, somebody is is holding on to those blueprints, or that somebody, when they came into this this lab after Tesla went bankrupt, that it might be hoarded in some attic in this local community. I think both are possible. Um, one of the things I learned um, there was a another television show on on the Tesla. I forget the name of it, but it was like the Tesla Files, and uh, Cameron Prince was involved in it. I helped get him the part in the show. And uh, they had a fellow there who was in his 80s who actually saw the papers when they first were delivered to Belgrade in the museum. He was still alive. He might still be alive. He'd be close to 90 right now. And he said that there were pages ripped out. Um, I can believe that. I also think that, you know, Tesla is, is a god in Serbia. And, uh, you know, you're a guy and you're looking at your, your, your hero, your Mickey Mantle, your, your Tom Brady, your, you know, your... Uh, uh, Babe Ruth, and there's a, a document that he signed or whatever, you might have squirreled it away. So it's very possible that even the, the, some people in, in his own homeland might be sitting on some of these papers, and certainly in, in America. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Wardenclyffe was ransacked, um, and papers were taken out, and, and, and uh, many uh, machines were stolen uh, in the 1916, 1917. There were articles about that. But if we look at this photo here, he wanted to send electrical power to uh, ships, to airplanes, so that planes would not have to have fuel, that they would get their energy uh, transmitted uh, uh, electrically. If that is possible, that really solves a great problem, of air pollution, and also, you know, it would change entirely the way we would fly airplanes. Just truly fantastic idea. Um, so that's, this is some of Tesla's great vision, and it's just a nice visual uh, from uh, Hugh of Gernsback in his sci-fi magazines. Gernsback met with Tesla many times, and it was Gernsback who, who published Tesla's autobiography, An Electrical Experimenter, in uh, 19, uh, 
1919. Okay, next slide. So Tesla is now, this is during World War uh, One. Tesla's working with the Germans and uh, Joe Sikorsky is working on a movie about this uh, right now. We uh, hel I helped him with some of the ideas in, in, the, in the new film. Uh, I think it's called Invisible Threads. And you can see here, nine, nine, 19 more taken as German spies. Dr. Carl George Frank, former head of Sayville Wireless, among those detained. He's the guy who hired Tesla. So he gets arrested. Uh, Jonathan Zenick gets arrested, sent to jail in, uh, in uh, Ogilvy in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, Ferdinand Braun dies in America. He's unable to uh, go back to Germany. And there really was a third column. There was uh, 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 von Papen was uh, a, a guy in, in um, Washington, D.C., who becomes the chancellor of Germany 15 years later. He was involved in sabotage. Um, and even in the assassinated, assassination attempt, J.P. Morgan Jr. To me, what's very important about this particular slide, though, is the, the information on the far right. It says Germans triple their wireless plant. So Tesla goes out to uh, Sable, Long Island, and he said, you've got to increase your ground connection. That's the way to send energy from Long Island to Berlin in Germany, 4,000 miles away. And once they do, they triple their uh, our ability to uh, uh, their output, and they become the most powerful wireless plant on the planet. This particular article in the New York Times, to me, is the most important article in all uh, of the research that I've done about Wardenclyffe, because this establishes uh, the reality that Tesla's plans at Wardenclyffe were viable. Here is the very proof. When he goes to the wireless system at Sava, which is set up on a different platform, and he says, do this, do that, and do this. You'll have a much more powerful system. They do all that. They, Zenek helps put it all together. And boom, they've got the most powerful plant on the planet. Right. That's remarkable. I, I, this, this is new to me. Uh, you know, it also opens up a question mark in that he continued to invent after Wardenclyffe. Like, so do you think he was a paid consultant to uh, the folks here? Or... Uh, was he doing this out of the goodness of his heart, giving them uh, advice and information? Well, he was paid by, by Telefunken. Um, okay. And then after that, he offered his services to the U.S. government. And he's old. But in 1940, he dies three years later. He gives all of his plans over to the American government. He gives his particle beam weapon to the American government. I have all of that in, in, in both books. Uh, I interviewed the very man who... Uh, who had the papers, sat on them for 40 years, the top secret particle beam weapon papers. Um, his name was Ralph Bergstresser. I have a lot of new information in, in the new book, Wizard at War, about Bergstresser. Uh, uh, he was in Burma and in China during World War II. His friends were killed, he comes back, and he, and he goes on a hunt to try and find the particle beam weapon. And he, and he interviews every single person that's still alive that knew Tesla. Uh, and I have all of that research in there. But what's important to answer your question directly, Tesla gave his information directly to the US government in 1940 because it was too dire now. He wanted to sell it to them initially, but we were uh, you know, on the verge of war and he simply handed over the details at that point. Mark, um, I, I just want you to cover anything else that you think is critical. I'd like to open it up to questions. We went. We went way over, but obviously I was happy to do so, but we do want to open it up to any questions the audience might have, but can you conclude with you know, anything else that you want to impart on, on us? Yeah, let's see the next slide. Yeah, we can put that on. Um, what I'd like to say is I continually learn from Tesla. I get letters all the time from 12 year old kids. Uh, I get it you know, two or three times a, a month from kids doing their research project on Tesla. Um, and uh, he is a tremendous inspiration. Everything you said, Mark, you said it so much uh, uh, better than I could say, is how important the science center is. That was my uh, appeal. I thought we should make Wardenclyffe a center of learning for the world. Tesla is a world hero. Uh, as you well know, when Matt Inman uh, set up the Oatmeal website to raise money, 
we raised uh, a million, $1.4 million from 33,000 people from 108 countries. 108 countries know about Tesla. We've got kids and researchers in all those places, and all those people would want to come to Wardenclyffe. Um, for me, what's so interesting about him is that as amazing as his early life was, working for Edison, then leaving Edison and working for uh, uh, George Westinghouse and setting up the hydroelectric power system, what's important about the hydroelectric power system among everything else, it's non-polluting and it runs forever as long as the waterfall still runs. So it's essentially free energy. Uh, and he's talking about running on the wheel work of nature. He wants to live within nature, not destroy nature uh, and uh, protect you know, the environment. That's why Elon Musk is saying the very same thing. And that's why he kept the name Tesla Motors uh, on his car because Tesla's a huge hero. So for me, um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a, a touch point, you know, he's a touchstone of, of inspiration. And that basically is the point that I wanted to make. Uh, we have one right. last slide, so let's just see the last slide and then. What is that last slide? <laughs> there he is, Debonair. So, you know, to that point, you know, Mark, part of my job is to go out and reach out to the Elon Musks of the world. And you, you mentioned before who invented the internet. I believe Vint Cerf invented that internet. He now works for Google. Um, and, you know, he's one of our advisors now as well. Uh, I, I go out and I meet these titans of tech and some of them, don't know the full story of Tesla. And I try to impart on them that this history is important to understand. It's not just Tesla history. We, we, we want to tell the Tesla story as accurately as possible, but we want to tell the story about his contemporaries. And we want to tell the story about the innovators of today. Because for Tesla to truly be celebrated, if he were to walk on site when we open, and all we did was talk about 100 years ago, I think he would be disappointed. He was about innovation to lift up humanity. And that's what runs through the ethos here. 108 countries in that crowd fund. There's researchers, there's innovators in all those countries. There's kids that can use STEM education. And we believe this, this is a hub, an epicenter to bring to crowdsource because we had a very successful crowd fund that saved the site to crowdsource the best STEM, the best innovation, and, and just try to do what this man tried to do over a hundred years ago. So with that, I am going to have Lisa open up uh, for questions from the folks that uh, have stuck with us through this podcast. So we've received a couple of questions, Mark. Um, one that keeps coming up is, is there going to be a second season of the Tesla files? The answer uh, seems to be no, unfortunately. Um, what happened, I think, was it was not Prometheus's fault. Prometheus did a tremendous job. They spent a couple of million dollars putting together these five shows. And we were set up to do a number of, of other shows. Uh, but the History Channel just really fell down in promoting it. And they, they dropped it right away. And uh, I know it has a cult following, but I think it would have gotten a lot better for viewing had they simply put a little bit of publicity uh, into it and given us more lead time to, uh, to let us know that the show was going to be on. So unfortunately, I do not think there'll be a second season. Okay. And they were also asking if the um, Cooper sphere in the Tesla files was real. I don't know what that is. Oh, okay. Uh, that was just another question that came up. We have a, uh, a question um, from our friends. Uh, uh, I'm going to probably butcher this name, but Nagranda uh, is a Tesla uh, enthusiast and he's also an electrical engineer. And his question was re directly related to um, the explosion connected with the Tesla uh, tower. He wanted to just uh, get your reaction to that. And if um, the explosion was somehow connected uh, from the Tunguska explosion, does that make any sense? Was that directed uh, directly related from the Tesla tower? Yes. Uh, the Tunguska explosion occurred in Siberia in 1908. Tesla's tower was basically dismantled, made disoperational in about 1904 when uh, Westinghouse came in and took away the generator. So I immediately dismissed the idea, but it, it persisted. Um, it was, it's a very creative idea. Oliver Nicholson came up with the idea to begin with. Uh, 
But the reason why I, I'm 99% sure that Tesla had nothing to do with the explosion at, at Tunguska is it what happened about two or three years ago. Do you remember when that asteroid uh, exploded in the atmosphere uh, someplace in Russia? There were photographs. You can Google it. You can see it as it's happening. An asteroid comes in. A thousand um, uh, uh, windows were blown out. Um, and this thing was just, you know, it was the size of a house. I mean, it was pretty large, uh, but it, it was not a direct hit. And I think what happened at Tunguska was a much larger asteroid skimmed the Earth. Um, and uh, once it enters the Earth's atmosphere, it's a huge, uh, you know, compression explosion. And that's what flattened all those um, trees. What's very interesting to me, because I was interested in Tesla, I learned about Tunguska uh, in uh, the 1970s. Uh, there's a lot of information that's hidden from us, and that's one of the important things about Tesla, and that is there's information that's hidden. Uh, one more thing I'd like to say about the coronavirus, Tesla was very involved in ozone uh, research. He built, built ozone machines, and ozone is known to kill viruses and to purify the air. Uh, it was used uh, to help uh, with wounds in um, World War uh, One. And uh, all I'm asking is that some of this eight point something billion dollars that they're using to fund research be used to, uh, to study the, the effect of ozone, breathe it in, would it help uh, uh, these people that are uh, afflicted with this? Uh, another thing that Tesla was involved with was sending electricity through the body for curative reasons. Bob Beck, uh, there's a Bob Beck um, uh, uh, YouTube right now which explains that a simple electrical device sending electricity through the body uh, may also have therapeutic effect. I'm not saying these definitely are the way to go. I'm saying they should be researched and found out if indeed uh, they work. But Tess was involved in both those. He was involved in cancer research too. Uh, All right. There's one more question that just came in and it's, um, is, is the vertical tunnel open and are horizontal metal pipes still there? There are 11 horizontal metal pipes still there. Those were the yellow images that we saw. The vertical shaft is still there. It was the brown shaft. And not only was the vertical shaft still there, but all the four tunnels are still there. Uh, the ground penetrating radar group uh, d discovered these tunnels and was able to map them out. So indeed they still exist. But to be, to be clear, we can't access them. They, they're underground and uh... You know, the, the, we'd have to dig up the ground, which, because it was one of the areas that the, um, the the company that came in after Tesla dumped some of their chemicals, we can't dig there right now. In the in the future, when we want to study those tunnels after we're an operating facility and we're open to the public, uh, we would probably apply for grants to study the tower base a bit more. But right now, the the ground is undisturbed and. There's no plan to dig there uh, for, the, for the next few years, at least. Great. I just want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in for our fro first episode of Tesla Unwired. Uh, be sure to go to our website at teslasciencecenter.org. These uh, types of uh, presentations and podcasts will be held on a monthly basis. And we'd love to see you all join our Facebook community and all of our social media. We can be reached on Instagram at the Tesla Science Center uh, Warden, Warden Cliff, and then on Facebook at Tesla Science Center. And our Twitter is at Tesla Science. But please visit our website for more up-to-date information. We have events like this happening all throughout the month. We even have some on-site events. We'd love to see you come down and participate. No, we don't, we don't have any on-site events not, right now. Not We're right now. On. Not right now. <laughs> we do have on-site events, hopefully happening in July. Hopefully we'll be up for the birthday. But uh, please check our check our website. Again, that's at teslasciencecenter.org. Thanks, Mark and Mark, for this great conversation. It's been really informative. Um, like I said, we'll be doing this on a monthly basis. So look out for some more great guests with Mark Alessi. And who knows who's to come, but we got a lot more. So thanks so much for joining on. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye -bye. you. Be safe.